Welcome Rockstar Teachers. I'm Pam from Rock and Resources and I wanted to talk to you today about scaffolding. I also want to invite you to come to my blog rockandresources.com where I share tons of tips and strategies. For scaffolding I have a category called step-by-step -step instruction and you will find all of the different blog posts that I have for scaffolding. I have my computer set up over here so that I can glance back and forth to make sure that I'm including all the information that I want to share with you. So let's get started. First of all, we all know that learning is a lifelong tool and students need to be able to understand the basics in order to get to the higher level thinking skills. And that's where scaffolding comes along. When I first started teaching, I was not using scaffolding in my classroom and I saw a lot of students really slip through the cracks and I don't want that to happen to you too. The best way is to go to these different blogs that share some educational tools and strategies, as well as find yourself a great mentor teacher in your building. Once I found somebody who was willing to share some ideas with me, I learned so much from her, and I hope you can find that person too. Let's get started. Okay, so scaffolding. I have a little visual for you. If you've watched any of my videos before, you know I'm a big visual person just so that you can understand. And basically how I look at scaffolding is step by step. You are starting with the basics and you're trying to get up to that higher standard or higher level thinking wherever you wanna go. And along the way, you're going to have students at the bottom step or in the middle step or wherever. And you're also going to have some students at the very top who are already ready to learn that standard. So what do you do with all of those students? That's where scaffolding comes along. So I like to look at it as this. You want to build your students up. Scaffolding is basically providing that support that they need, what kind of support they need to build them up to the point where they can go off on their own and learn independently. Even your higher level students who are already up here, they might need that boost. So when some teachers ask me, well, should I just scaffold for my lower students? I say no. Start scaffolding with everyone and then you can start letting some of them go off on their own and just work with the lower students. All right, so let's see. I wanna make sure I'm including everything here. Oh, I also talk about how we should teach to a buffet, not to a set menu because our students come in from so many different backgrounds and so many different learning styles, and we wanna make sure that that is all ready for them. All right, I'm gonna skip on over to my next blog post because I do wanna share with you, oh, I need to make that a little bit bigger. My eyes can't see that. Okay. All right, so on my next blog post, I talked to you about the differences between scaffolding and differentiating. If you follow me, you know that my motto is to motivate, educate, and differentiate. And I have blog posts on differentiation and videos and so much more of that as well. But the education part of motivate, educate, differentiate is the scaffolding. And it's about giving them that support and education that they need, whether it comes from learning independently or if it comes from building up some skills, which I'm gonna to talk to you in just a second. So the differences between differentiation and scaffolding. If you had a certain project, say you're giving a book report and you, had, you wanted them to do some kind of a report at the end, if you were differentiating, that would mean that you would want to give those students different learning levels or different learning styles. And that means, say, you give them different levels of passages or you give them different books. For example, say you were doing a chocolate unit and you wanted all the students to learn, you know, something along the chocolate for your theme, but they have to read on their level. You might want to have one group read Chocolate Fever, another Chocolate Touch, another Charlie and the Chocolate Factory to get in those different reading levels or, and I have that in my store too, if you need that, and also differentiated passages, which I'm big on, and I have that as well. But that goes along with all the standards where you can focus on that. So let's go back to the project, the book report. If you were differentiating, you would give them the different levels, and you would also either give them a choice for their project at the end, 
or assign different projects for the different groups. Say you have many students that are visual learners or auditory learners or kinesthetic. You want to give them what they need in their learning. Maybe it's giving them a skit or developing a poster or building something, depending on what they need. So that is what differentiating is. Scaffolding is when you're giving them that support. Whether you're giving them that boost they need to continue or you're giving them basic skills that they need to get to that level. So if you were giving them that book report, you would want to think of, okay, we're all going to get to this end, but how can I support them to get to that point? You might want to give them step-by-step -step instructions or you want to you might want to you know make sure that everyone knows where they're going but then stay there with the students who really need to get there and this is when it's really important if you have a big project to give them a little deadline so you have a project that's due in a month you would want to give your students some little deadlines hey get this done by here and i'll help you through and set up a little table in the background or in the back of your room and say you could come back and if you need any help along the way, and of course I know you'll be circulating around and see who needs help, but that support is what you need. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second too. Okay, so I wanna move on to um, the different ladders that I talk about in my blog post. And one is the ladder of skills and the ladder of support. So you want to be able to build independence for your students. You want them to be able to stand off on their own. One way to do that is through the fishbowl activity. And a fishbowl activity basically is a demonstration. Whether you are demonstrating it for the students or you have one of your students who excel at that area demonstrate it for them. And then the students can see exactly what they're expected to do. And then here comes explicit teaching, which I talk about in just about all of my units. Explicit teaching is super, super, super important. And what that is, is you are bringing in all kinds of different learning for the students. You have whole group, you have small group, you have partners, you have independent work, and it's all built in with that same skill. For example, say you were teaching a skill on um, complete sentences. If you were teaching that skill, you would have an anchor chart where you do the mini lesson and you're sharing that information with them so the whole group gets to see that. Then you're going to move on to maybe some mentor text or something like that, but you also want to model so that the students see that. And I go big into modeling when it comes to essay writing because you want to show the modeling all along the way to get to that final copy. Modeling is super important as well. Then you want to add in that practice. And this is where you could have the different levels of practice in there. You know, you might have some students who need a lot of practice and some students are ready to move on to that next step. And you can work with the students who need more practice and let those others move on as long as they know the expectations for what they need to do next. And then you also want to have the application part where they're applying what they know. And I love to add in the sharing because whenever students are sharing their different ideas then they come up with more ideas as well. So that is what explicit teaching is. Then I like to talk about thinking out loud and this goes along with the modeling as well. Whenever you are I'm gonna go back to essay writing. Whenever you're talking about brainstorming ideas for an essay, you want to think out loud so that the students are hearing how you're thinking. You might wanna say, oh, you know, if I'm going to pick my favorite pet, I would pick a cat. I'd pick a cat because I have a dog and a cat, and I just love how my cat snuggles with me all the time. And you're just thinking out loud just so that the students can hear, you know, what, how your thought process is going and how they can develop their own opinion. Then I move on to collaboration and peer practice because there are so much, many studies out there that talk about the importance of peer collaboration and peer practice and peer reflections and all of that because when you have students who understand a skill 
and then you have other students who are having you know trouble with that skill grouping them together they can learn off of each other and maybe this student over here that was struggling in one skill might exceed in another skill and they can do the same thing for their group and you could go back and forth with that because they really can learn with each other when you do group activities and small groups and partners they can really learn from each other then I'm going to talk about building the skill. Think about you know, a young child. You're going to make sure that they can identify letters before you move on to sight words. You're going to make sure that they know sight words before you move on to small sentences. You're going to make sure that they can understand that before you build up your sentences. So you're building that skill. Well, that goes along with so many things that you could do and especially you know with the upper elementary classrooms you might want to repeat some of those younger skills you know that they learned in second third or fourth grade if you're teaching fifth grade because they might need to have that extra practice or that review before you move on to this higher level thinking or this higher standard that they haven't been introduced to before one idea for that is to have a logical framework in mind. Think about what you need to get out of them. What background knowledge do they have? This is great when um, you can use KWL charts, which I have some of those free in my store. This is what they know, what they want to know, what they have learned, and you can see where they are and what they might need for that particular area. Or I have notice, think, and wonder, where they, know, they get an image and they tell what they notice, then they tell what they're thinking about and what they're wondering about, and that way you can gauge their thinking as well. Other ideas might be to um, include picture walks, book boxes, any kind of charts or concept maps, those kind of things are really great. And then moving into step-by-step -step skills. And this is what I work on all the time. I have many, many units that go along with step-by-step -step skills in reading and writing. And what that means is you're going to build them up. You don't want to just throw theme at them when they don't have any concepts of summarizing or main idea or anything like that. So what that means is Think about theme, and theme is introduced in the Common Core in fourth grade. If the students don't have a basic knowledge of story elements, which is what, first or second grade, if they don't have that basic knowledge of the different story elements, if they don't understand main idea and detail, if they don't understand summarizing, and if they don't understand really what topics and lessons and morals are, then how are you going to teach them theme? It's going to be difficult. So you want to go through and review those skills with them to reach that higher skill. And that's what I'm talking about with the step. You would start by talking about character, setting, problem, solution, move on to main idea and details, summarizing the story, then move on up and talk about topics. What are topics? What are lessons and morals? And then you can move into that higher thinking, higher level thinking or standard that you want them to learn. So step by step is scaffolding. You're building them up. And you know what? There might be some students who don't need a review of story elements. And that's for you to decide. Do you want them to continue on or you do, do you want them to stay back and at least get that quick little review with you. Then I'd like to talk about front load information. And what that means is two things, brainstorming and giving information. Whenever we're, I'm gonna go back to writing. We talked about reading, now I'll go back to writing. Okay, so brainstorming. Whenever the students are writing an essay or anything, you want them to come up with their ideas. And that's when you know the graphic organizers are great, little groups are great, but you want them to brainstorm what they want in their paper because you don't want them to get to that rough draft stage and be like, oh, I have no idea what to write. But if you prepare them that front load information, 
when they get to that point, they won't be as reluctant because they have that information built in and they have ideas flowing. That goes along with word lists. I am big, big, big into word lists. Whether we're writing poems and I have different themed word lists, I have a sports word list, you know, different baseball, basketball, football, all of that, depending on what they choose for their sport or activity. I have nature word lists or seasons or month by month word lists. So whenever we're writing, because I like to write poetry every month, so they would have that for, you know, they would have that background to do their writing. Then for word lists, if it's essay writing, I'll have many thesauruses or I'll have a bunch of word lists on, on ideas for your introduction. I'll have word lists for transition words or word lists for million dollar words, things that they can put in their writing. And that's word choice. That's what I call word choice. Having that front load information just gives them more confidence and it builds them up. And see, that's what we keep saying. We want to build them up. The next thing is purposeful questioning. So what does that mean? You want to give the students or provide some questions that they might come up with to avoid that step. Think of if you're ever on a website and there's frequently asked questions. That is so important because then you don't have to take the time to ask that question. Or you might have that student who struggles and is shy and they don't want to raise their hand and ask a question thinking that everybody's going to think that they're being, you know, they have a stupid question. And I know we all say there's no stupid questions, but we always have those students who won't ask that question. So purposeful questioning is when you give them, think about all the things that they could possibly ask about. Because you know your lesson and you know how you want it to go about, but you have to put your lesson in a student's eyes and the questions that they might come up with. Or if you did this lesson the previous year and you had those questions, it'd be a great idea to like write those down so that you can cover that whenever you go to do your lesson. And then that way, they, they will have all that covered and won't be asking as many questions. Then I talk about anchor charts and graphic organizers, which I did a little bit before, but those visuals are, I mean, I'm big, big, big into visuals, and maybe because I'm a visual learner, but it's so easy if you give them a visual. Um, I was gonna, just pull over something real quick. I don't know if this is gonna fit in my screen. Hopefully it does. Okay, so like I like to do visuals like for cause and effect and show if you are watering the little tiny flowers down here, which would be the cause, then you would have the big flowers, which would be the effect. And then that way they see the, that visual and I'll put these little visuals and all their little worksheets or all the different things that we're doing and I'll keep that in the room or displayed somewhere so that they can refer back to those visuals. And that's really, really helps along with graphic organizers so that they can organize their thoughts and have that visual on how it's supposed to be put together. For example, if you had essay writing and you had your graphic organizer for your introduction and your three you know, body parts and your conclusion, then when they go to do their rough draft, they can see how that all fits together. Then I talk about sharing, and this is all on my blog post. I'm just grabbing ideas off of here, so you could definitely go there and read some more or whatever you need. Share your vision. I always try to tell the students, we always give them the expectation or what they need to do, but I share that vision. You know, first you would want to do this, next you want to do this, last you want to do this, and put that together for them. If you're verbally telling them how to put it together, along with your visuals and everything else, then the students won't have those questions. And I talk about sharing your trajectory, which is first, next, last, making sure that they understand what they need to do. Basically, no matter how or why you scaffold, 
that support is key to their learning because their learning is lifelong and if we give them those foundations and build it up, then they're going to have success. I'm Pam from Rock and Resources. I'm glad you joined me for my scaffolding ideas and I'd like to see you some more of my videos, my other videos.